I wanted to, uh, first of all, say thank you for uh, being here and not being on vacation, because many of uh, the rest of our group is. Uh, but I also wanted to uh, make sure to tell you that next month, at our next event, uh, which is the fourth Wednesday, uh, we'll be at the other impact hub at the Funk Zone location. So uh, they're going to do construction in this space uh, starting in the fall, and so we're going to be moving down to the Funk Zone uh, uh, probably indefinitely. Uh, so same time, same day of, of the month, but a different location, and we want to make sure everybody knows that. Uh, so, uh, thanks for being here. As you know, we're talking about uh, things every business leader should know. Uh, and today we're going to be talking about narrative uh, and marketing and being able to kind of communicate what we do in a way that people understand it. And so Rich Schutte and Doug Holt are going to lead that. We're already a little behind, so I'm going to let them jump in. Good morning. Great. Thank you guys for being here. Um, so I'm going to ask everybody right now, uh, if you have a cell phone, just go ahead and grab it. And I'm not going to ask you to turn it off. But one of the questions that we went through when we were presenting the presentation was, how do we get the information out? So Rich is going to go over specifically a number of handouts and worksheets, uh, as well as myself. So if you'd like to get all the slides right now, all you have to do is text the word growth to this phone number, and we'll send those slides to you, as well as Rich's handouts. And then you also have the opportunity of getting a copy of Rich's book that he was working on um, sent to you as well for free. So go ahead and just take text growth to this number, um, and then we'll get started. So without further ado, Mr. Shuni. So as a speaker, I don't know what's harder in terms of you know being nervous or not. It's like you know, a full room or one that's got empty seats. Um, I'm a little nervous, so I'll just say that a few empty seats makes it a uh, makes it more difficult. Um, human beings ultimately communicate right with each other more effectively than any other way through storytelling. And I am a very strong believer that in terms of how we are able to get the story out about what it is that we do, how we do it, who we work with, and why it's important to us through stories. There wasn't a single time when I was a kid that I would be out with my grandfather that he wouldn't bend down onto the ground and find a penny. Inevitably, he'd always find a penny sitting somewhere on the ground whenever we were walking someplace. And without fail, every single time that he did, he picked that penny up and he'd hand it to me. He's like, here's sunshine, this is to your next million. Interesting. Um, it's a lot of pennies, right, if you think about it. My grandfather was my personal hero. Right? He, he was the man that is responsible for what it is that I'm doing today. He was a business owner. He was an entrepreneur. He was like every single one of us in this room. Right? He was a guy that who, when he was 14 years old in 1929, two months before the Great Depression actually set in, his father was gunned down and murdered as a police chief of a Chicago suburb. <clears throat> At 14 years old, not yet going into the eighth grade, he had to stop his life and go to work. He had to support his family, his brothers and sisters, his mom. He worked in a bowling alley, setting pins. Think about that now, right? You hit the reset button, and you know whatever happens happens. And you get really mad because you have to walk, walk up to the counter, tell them because your ball didn't come down fast enough, and they got to do something for you. Well, in those days, right? What happened was you actually had a guy that sat in a milk crate, and as the ball rolled down, you'd hear the aisle or the lane that it came from, and he'd run over and he'd figure out what was there, and he'd reset the pins, and then bring them back down, and then the bowler could roll their next ball. That's what he did. So he did in the wintertime. In the summertime, he was at a golf range, and he picked golf balls, right? One at a time. Shirtless, with two baskets sitting on either side, and spent his entire day like this, right? picking balls, with his back, of course, to the team line. Because <laughs> the stories around that in and of itself, in terms of how golfers would try to hit him, he actually preferred when they did because most of them would air out and miss him, right? It was the one that were trying to miss him that always hit him. <laughs> but nonetheless, that, that was what he did. And he worked his way through that scenario to where that golf range, when he left for World War II, was basically promised him the lease on that land, was promised to him when he returned from the war. Which was pretty cool, right? Now, my grandmother was miserable over that promise because he happened to be stationed there from the Chicago area. He happened to be stationed here in Santa Barbara when the airport was the Marine base. He was an MP. My grandmother 
trip about that long to move here in 1943 with my dad, who happened to be like two months old at the time, and live up on Pedagosa, right, in heaven. Of course, when the war was over and he had to go back to Chicago, my grandmother was pretty pissed. <laughs> but nonetheless, he did. He went back to that range and he operated that range for his whole career. He took that opportunity, right, not to just operate a range, but to make friends, to tell stories. He built his business one cup of coffee at a time, right? That's what he did. It was one cup of coffee at a time in terms of how he brought in the clientele. To when by the time he was done with that range in 1968 is when he retired, he had parlayed that into, you know, a house that was fully paid for, into, into the ability to retire, into the ability to actually at one point over a cocktail, right, at the front of the range, to be able to get a tip on a company that was getting started out of the Chicago area. That company was called Teletape. Reeves Communications later rolled up into Viacom. Right? That company was responsible for the first live sports broadcast in television and also did Sesame Street. And he was the founding share member right, through an investment that he made, one golf ball at a time. In 1968, when he retired, he had a net worth of about $5 million, right? This is when individuals weren't millionaires, right? This is when Robert Barron's were millionaires, right? So for him to have been a millionaire at that time was a big deal. That portfolio just had nothing happen to it and just inflation happened. That $5 million is worth about $35 million in today's day and age. Now think about what could have happened to that estate, to that net worth, to that, that, that family, our family, had that money been properly husband, husbanded, had proper advice been given, had he had resources around him to actually make decisions. Because we as business owners, we know it all, right? Not because we really think that we do, but because we have to. And so what happens is, is you spend your days, right, doing this same thing over and over and over again, realizing you don't have these resources unless you seek them out, right, to where you have to know it all. And so when he did solicit advice, when he realized he needed it, he didn't get good advice. When my grandmother passed away in 2008, we as a family were concerned that there wouldn't be enough money to finish her final expenses. Right? Had she lived this much longer, right, that estate wouldn't have been enough to be able to keep her in the home that she was living in. Right? That, would have been, that would have come down to next generations. And that's the power of advice. That's the value of advice. And so I'm lucky that I looked up to this man. I saw the impact that it had on it. But when I was 12 years old, right, he actually bought me a subscription to the Wall Street Journal. And he used to call me on the phone every day over the summer and say, hey, you know, what's Teletape doing? Look it up. And that was how he created a relationship with me, and that's how that got me into the business that I'm in. And the reason that I'm doing it the way I'm doing it today is because of his experience and what we saw in terms of what happens when you don't get good advice. Does that help you understand a little bit about what I do? Maybe a little bit better than if I stood up here and said, yeah, we do all management. What do I do with that? Was that an effective story at all? Did I get to draw you in a little bit to my life and to, to, to who I am and why I do what I do? Okay. So here's the thing about storytelling, right? I, I led off by saying this. We communicate that way, right? It goes back to caveman days. It goes back to campfires. It goes back to you know paintings on the wall, right? It's all about that story. That's how we communicate what we do, our skill set from one generation to the next generation to the next generation. We're wired as human beings to do that. In today's day and age, it's interesting, unless you're a millennial, you don't think you're that interesting. <laughs> they don't have that problem, right? But, you know, we do. And so as we sit here and think about that, it's like, well, that's great, he's got a story. How lucky for him that his story winds up, you know, tying into what it is he does. Let me suggest this. That wasn't an easy story for me to craft, right? It's true. It's what I went through. But being able to actually tell that story in a way that's comfortable, and get it out in a way that people can actually get a taste of what it is that I'm doing was not an easy thing to do. And I gotta tell you, that story is not really all that interesting to me. Now, I'm not sure if it was interesting to you or not, but I want to believe that it was, and I want to believe that it was an effective way for me to communicate what, I, what it is that I wanted to say to you today, right? And so every single one of you in this room has dozens of stories, right? And one that can be crafted Right, to be able to message what it is that you do, why you do it, and how you can attract the people that you want around you to do it with you. Right? And that's that. So as we continue through this morning, right, Doug's going to give us some tips in terms of how we can actually take these stories 
and bring them out into the world a little bit more. And I'm going to be part of a little bit of a case study, if you will, when it goes into one of the ways I'm trying to get my story out. Okay. Um, again, that number's up there for a good reason. <laughs> We're going to have this available to you, and what it is is actually just a two-page exercise in terms of how can you craft your own story, right? where it is in you, and some places that you can find it, and then actually go and create it. And trust me, it's not going to be a first-time effort. And I've finessed that story over the years a lot of different ways, right? The truth of the matter is, is that subscription of Wall Street Journal came when I was in fourth grade, not when I was 12. But when we get into this book that Doug had mentioned, right, I wrote forward to the writer that actually helped me craft my story thought it was more powerful for me to say that that subscription came when I was 12. Because what's a fourth grader know about the Wall Street Journal or a stock? Right? So again, your story is not necessarily going to be 100% accurate. Right? There's going to be details that you'll tweak to, to, to get to what you want to do. But then once you have that, what you can do with that story is almost, almost limitless, right? And to the extent that I'm talking about that, this book right here, right, which is very, very closely tied to what it is that I do, it's called Becoming Seriously Wealthy, How to Harness the Strategies of the Super Rich and Ultra Wealthy Business Owners. That's what I work with. That's what I do. And I have the opportunity to write the forward of this book. And I can tell you about two-thirds of the forward is my story. Because the intent is, is that that's going to bring the reader into why it is that they're reading this in the first place. So, <clears throat> as you text that, you have the opportunity to actually get an address where you'd like us to send this book to you. It's yours, complimentary, should you wish for it. Just ask. There are some really cool strategies in here. My story's in there. I hope I told it accurately. <clears throat> um, this is my story. I think I've got it down pretty good. But, um, there's just a couple, <clears throat> like 10 seconds here, and a tease. There's the book. <clears throat> Why are we here? This is an interesting slide. And the book has made up a lot of these statistics, right? Successful business owners want to be wealthier. Is that kind of a shock to anybody? <laughs> anybody here that doesn't want to be wealthier? The five. <laughs> is that 5.7% in this room? Right? <laughs> okay. Great. No shock. But this is enlightening to me, right? When you ask why, it's not for the extra toy. It's not for the, the, the big house on the hill. It might be to actually live and survive in Santa Barbara. but. For the most part, right, what it is, is to be able to take care of our loved ones. And I can tell you, sitting in this room, some of my clients and people I'm very close to, and I know that this is absolutely 100% true. Right? Be meaningfully more supportive of charitable causes, right? Great. It's a big deal to people with a, a lot of net worth. And then, of course, to change the world for the better. So there are dreamers in here, and you know, the 12% want to make the world a better place with their money. Anyways, those are the kinds of things you're going to find in this book. The value of the second opinion for anybody, right, is huge. And I would encourage all of you to think about that in terms of your own lives, your own situations, your own, your own, your own, not just wealth situations, but how you're doing things within your business, within your family, within all the things that are important to you. <clears throat> right? You're sick. No, I'm not. I want a second opinion. 41% of us actually want a second opinion if we're sick. Yet, yeah, barely over 10% of us want a second opinion on the stuff that actually is going to get us to the finish line. Right? But, Last thing I'm going to say, actually two last things I'm going to say. <laughs> in terms of the value of that second opinion, in a medical situation, about two-thirds, whereas almost 90% of people that actually received a personal financial second opinion, there's value. The people that are doing this aren't us, right? We don't take the time to do that. But you know who it is? The super rich, right? The highly wealthy, the family offices. They're actually obtaining second opinions almost constantly almost in every case, right? We owe that to ourselves, right? As business owners and as people that are trying to make our way and find a better way of doing it. Okay. <clears throat> I don't know about this guy, so. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm gonna learn something as far as how I can get this book out. So. Yeah. Well, thank you. Actually, take notes for me, please. <laughs> So, as Rich said, when we were talking about what we are going to do for this talk, um, a lot of what I do is consulting for business owners um, and how they get their word out for a variety of reasons. So I thought about this because Rich and I started talking and I went into Rich's office and we were talking about what our slides were going to be and how it was going to go and Rich said, geez, by the way, I have this book that I just made, you know, that I just had or have made for me. And I was like, wow, why did I know about that? And he's like, well, I don't know, why didn't you know? And it was kind of a joke and we laughed a little bit, but it was something that I hear often whether it be products or services. And when I asked Rich, well, geez, how are you getting this out there? 
Um, when we had our conversation was, well, geez, I'll go to Troika's or these normal business luncheons, and I'll, I'll hand them out one at a time to people that are interested. I thought, geez, that's interesting. You know, how many, what percentage of your clients, high net worth individuals or clients that we all use, use the internet? The answer, 100%. 100% of them. Now, we're all taking our time here to be in this room and to use our time and leverage it, right? But if we're leveraging our time, can we leverage it more successfully and actually hyper-target our market or the market that we're after? Uh, and I believe the answer is yes. And this is a common question that I get from a lot of business owners. And hopefully, I'll give you some tactics and strategies that you can use as well uh, as we go through this. But this is the next thing that comes in, and it came with our conversation. Doug, this doesn't apply to me. I, this, this doesn't apply. You know, I understand this is great for you know, so-and-so's business, or maybe it's an IT company or a web company. But I'm a brick and mortar, I'm a service professional, or we do something else, we sell a widget. Um, and I'm going to disagree. I'm going to disagree because I think we live in a different environment. You know, just by a show of hands, and let's just get an idea because I hear this so much. How many of you actually use the internet? <laughs> yeah, right? Yet we think that our ideal client doesn't. We think that our ideal avatar, the person that we want to communicate with, doesn't. Now, I'm here to say one-on-one -on -one conversations and personal conversations are the absolute best. So I think Rich should go out and meet him, <laughs> talk about his story and tell it. And he tells it very effectively. But really, if you're selling a product, or a service, the internet allows you to leverage things at a much better rate and tell that story effectively and efficiently. Um, you know, even if you're looking for quality employees, you know, I had a conversation, I was doing a speech two weeks ago here in Santa Barbara and I talked to another business owner, you know, it was over a glass of wine, maybe two, and they were complaining like, hey, I just can't find quality employees. And we talked about this before here. Um, and what I talked to him about is we started to go down with what kind of employees are you looking for? Where can you find them? And we were actually able to hyper-target that individual. Even with you know, just Facebook advertising, let alone LinkedIn or something else that I'll show you, there's over 2,000 different checkboxes that you can select to hyper-target your market. You can really narrow it down specifically to the individual that you're after or the actual avatar. Or running for office. Now we all know a famous person in office right now that uses the internet perhaps maybe too much depending on what you think. Uh, but I have a client running for Senate and we leverage the internet. He can't go out and shake hands with everybody. Uh, this is how do we tell his story effectively. And the way that we're telling his story effectively to help him win his race is very similar for Rich in his book or for you, whatever product or service that you might have. And so previously we used to put an ad or something in, in a paper or an op-ed or an editorial, but now our days look like this. We have chats coming at us. You know, we're using social media. And this is a conversation I had before. Hey, my clients aren't on Facebook. They're not on there. You know, high net worth individuals, they just don't go to Facebook. Are you? Yeah. You're, you're looking at your kids, your friends' kids. People are on social media. Now, maybe you're not always on Facebook. Maybe you're not always on LinkedIn. But chances are you're using the internet and there's ways to leverage that technology, whether it be email, your website, or something else that you have to actually get the word out there and create a great impression and tell your story effectively that draws people in just like Rich did um, and utilizing his methods. But now what, right? So you've got a great product or service, and I can tell you right now, as someone who does a lot of consulting and marketing, I can never help anybody that's got a crappy product or a crappy product. You just can't. You can drive people to it, and if they can't tell their story effectively as Rich does, nothing you can do. And so when you get somebody like Rich with his book, he's like, great, now Doug, what do I do? Here I am, I got a microphone, but I'm not speaking to anybody. I don't have an audience, and I don't know what to do. And the biggest thing that I see time and time again is people don't really truly understand who their audience is. Who am I trying to speak to? Yeah, I want to sell to everybody. I, you know, I got this product, I can sell it to every business owner. Never works, right? Or at least I've never seen it work. And really getting that hyper target and finding where your audience currently is, not where you think that they are, is critical, right? A lot of us like to think that the person that we're targeting is special, and they are, of course, to some degree, but they're actually humans. And they actually are going to be not necessarily what you may think they are. And the data is out there. But even at the C-suite level, when I work with marketing companies, and we just, my agency just worked with a Fortune 200 company, that their marketing department, they didn't know who their client avatar was. So this is basic one-on-one -on -one marketing, right? Who is your avatar? Who are the people that you're actually speaking to? Now, I only recommend that you only come up with three. So there's three different types of people maximum that you're trying to reach or trying to get your story to. Because if you try to get your story to everybody, you diffuse it. It's diffused and it gets lost in the wind. So figuring out who you're actually speaking to, so in Rich's case, 
who are his clients, what are their actual goals? Well, they want to become wealthy. Okay, that's one thing they want to do, but what else do they want? What else are you speaking to? Why do they want to do it? What are their values? Where are they from? What books are they reading? Really understanding and getting into the shoes of your ideal target or your ideal market allows you to effectively communicate. Now, all of us do this naturally on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Right? We think we know what the other person wants, but how often are we actually talking to that person to really feel and understand what they're going through? You know, when I came here this morning, not one person asked me about my business. People asked me about my, my newborn. They asked me about the adventures that I'm on. I have a, a sprinter van that I converted. They're asking me all these questions, mostly because they've seen me, and they see me often through social media, and they know what's going on with my life. People do business with people. And knowing what challenges and things and pain points that people are really going through is critical to getting your message out there, but getting your message out to the right person. You know, none of us wants to speak to a thousand people if maybe one or two percent are going to come by and convert. We'd rather speak to ten people where we think ninety percent are going to convert, right? In a business situation. We also want to speak to people we like. And that's really critical, at least to me. You know, when we do our client avatars internally, values is a huge thing that we look at. You know, our business, we don't want to look at we work with business owners that we feel lack integrity. It's just not something we're about. And so these are things that we really break down. And I, oftentimes, I think this is the, the critical step that most people miss. So what are we really talking about? This is a traditional marketing funnel. I'm sure everybody's seen this as business 101. But what we're really talking about is where do we get people in the top of the funnel, but not only get them in the top of the funnel, because that's easy. Right? Now this could, top of the phone doesn't have to be digital. This can be actually analog. This could be just like this room. Right? We could have all the people you here, but if we don't have the right people here, it's worthless. Right? From a business standpoint, not a relationship. So how do we get them? Where do we find them on here? And what metrics are we using? And how do we get them to the bottom of the funnel? Which is conversions. Which as business owners, that's what we want. We want to work with great people. We want to get them in the door. So this is Rich's awareness. He's got the book. But now how do we not only get them in the door, but we get them actually to convert to clients and customers. So telling the story effectively, getting them in for the awareness phase, getting them to the like phase, and then actually get them actually to convert to clients or customers. And this is that So great. I know who they are, but where are they? All right. I, I, how do you find them? And I alluded to this a little bit ago, and I think it's really interesting because most people think, okay, if I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use Facebook because most people know it, but there's a lot of mediums you can use. Uh, Facebook advertising, great. You just select the location, you just select the job title, got it, male, female, between 30 and 50, whatever it may be. But again, there's over 2,000 different selections you can do through a lot of these platforms, and Facebook's being one of them. I can target people based on income, based on marital status, are they separated, divorced, Have they, are they friends with somebody who's getting married? There's all kinds of micro niches you can really target down to find what audience you're speaking to and where to find them. And Facebook just won. Google, you have all kinds of different avenues to go through. So when Rich and I were talking, we're talking about business owners. Doing a Troika, right? Troikas, if you've been to one, it's traditionally three people sitting together. You know, you have lunch, it's great conversations. I happen to enjoy them quite a bit. But for Rich to actually get out and get his book out there, he would have to be doing Troikas maybe 15 hours a day every day to even reach remarkable numbers. So I did a quick search. I was like, okay, business owners. That's who Rich just wants to talk to. And obviously, we can micro that down. But on LinkedIn alone, in Santa Barbara, there are 10,512 people that just have the title business owner, owner in their name. Now, if you could effectively communicate that your audience to those 10,500 people on a regular basis. Now, people don't buy. Just, they don't go, oh, great, I'm going to buy that. They have to be in a buying state, right? But if you come first to mind when they're in that buying state, that's where the gold happens, right? You're the first person they think of. Now, there's somebody sitting here today that told me one time, I was like, geez, you're everywhere. Everywhere I go, Doug, I see you, and I'm almost tired of seeing your updates. I see them all the time. And I, and I thought, awesome. <laughs> Perfect, that's exactly what I want. Because that person has become a client, because when they're in that buying state, who do they think of? I'm there, I'm there, and I've done something to provide value, right? I'm not just there saying, buy from me, buy from me. But by providing value and telling my story, which I'm going to tell a lot better now that I've got Rich's worksheet, I don't tell it nearly as eloquently, but this is something that Rich could do, or you could do, really effectively. Now, if you decide that this is not paid, these are just people you can connect with and have relationships digitally, then make do troikas with them very strategically. If you want to do paid advertisement, LinkedIn's telling me, hey, just for business owner, if I dig a little deeper and set Santa Barbara, my target audience, that's over 12,000 people, Doug, that you can target. If you could actually get in front of 12,000 people at one time to show your message, 
Some of those people are already in the buying state, right? But most aren't, but you're out in front of them and you're actually able to communicate to them in a way that they can relate to and provide value. They naturally want to, through the, the law of reciprocity, are going to want to do something for you. Now, the key again is to provide value first, leave with value, and then come back and be able to say, hey, look, if you're looking, if you want to become a millionaire and you want to know the secrets, Rich is your guy. Rich can do it. And this is a great way of creating awareness. Now, there's also an advantage to something like this, and LinkedIn just released this maybe two months ago, top of my head, but they also have really creative, and Facebook's better at it, and so is Google, but retargeting options. So if Rich has an ad out here, let's say, for example, and you want to become a millionaire, um, Secrets of the Rich, come to my website. You go to the website, and then if you're like me, baby screaming, my wife's yelling at me, I shut the laptop down, and I run away, and I come back, and I'm searching something totally different. Right? I'm off on my own little internet world, then I'm off searching something else, next vacation that I want to take, or what have you. Rich has the ability to retarget me. Right? So retargeting is really just saying, this is now a warm or hot lead because I've already ex uh, expressed interest in the subject that I'm interested in. So I've gone to Rich's website, I've said, yeah, this book looks interesting, but maybe I left. For whatever reason. Now he goes, hey, this is a warm lead. He's out able to serve me targeted, focused ads specifically to me based on this. Now LinkedIn is the most expensive advertising venue out there, pretty, not the most, but from the major social networks, it is the most expensive. But what, what is that client worth? What is your average client value? You know, when you're telling the story as effectively as Rich does, what actually is the value for each client? And that's what you really want to calculate. It's also something I didn't include here, but it's, it's, there's formulas. It's a mathematical formula to understand what your client, average client value is and then calculating on that, what's it worth to you to get that client and making sure seeing what you're willing to pay. So oftentimes in my world in marketing, you always hear LinkedIn's too expensive. I think that's crazy because nothing's too expensive. So if a client's worth $1,000 to you and it costs you $400 to acquire a client, you do that all day, all day. So why is that too expensive? It, it, especially if I now I have 12,000 people I can target. It doesn't make any sense to me. Um, so we look at those things. So then I look at Facebook, all right. Who in Santa Barbara claims to be a business owner on Facebook? Right? There's no way to verify that. But I'm just specifically looking at business owners, people that say they're business owners in the Santa Barbara area within 25 miles. And so on Facebook, there's 3,200 people. Right? Much more hyper-targeted. They, they have probably the best advertising platform, in my opinion, right now, if you want to serve ads. But you can serve content to them. So someone like Rich could serve parts of his book. He can serve the story. He can serve videos things that are engaging and interesting to draw in an audience, then he can further tell them more about his story and then obviously bring them into his office would be the end, the end goal, I would assume. Well, closing would be the end goal. But this now, you've got an additional 3,200 people. There's going to be crossover. So now if you think about this, there's crossover you're telling your story on LinkedIn, now you're telling your story on Facebook, you're just going to see people everywhere. There's a reason that Coca-Cola and Budweiser advertise all the time. Everybody knows who they are, but every once in a while you go to this gas station or something, you're like, hmm, some reason I want to go. And you don't, it just clicks to your mind. They're first to mind all the time. So other ideas that we use effectively. That, and this is probably the most underutilized one that I see with business professionals is podcasts. We came in today, we were talking about a podcast upstairs. Um, people listen to podcasts. They listen to them all the time. Just like traditional media, most people don't realize traditional media, what do they need? They need stories. They need news. They need something that's engaging. They're always looking for something. And that's why when you turn on the news sometimes, you're like, okay, it must be a slow news day because these stories <laughs> are pretty boring and it's nice to know how the dog got lost and everything. But podcasts are easier, right? Easier barrier to entry and they're hyper-targeted. You can find a podcast in any industry. I've yet not to find an industry that I've had a client work with that you can get them on a podcast. And podcast, it's hard for them to find guests because most podcasts aren't run by professional media companies, most. They're run by individuals who want to tell a story, want to tell a message, want to serve. And getting onto a podcast that's relevant is critical. You know, and podcasts also rank really highly in search engines. They're all searchable. So if you're searching for a subject or your client is searching for a subject and they find you out on a podcast as a guest expert, you now have that perceived legitimacy as an expert in your field because somebody interviewed you on the phone. It's brilliant. Guest posts, really simple, also free, although there's, now it's become a paid whole industry, but you can actually post relevant content on other people's websites. Right? All of us can write, all of us can speak, you're all intelligent individuals. Now you have the opportunity to post your content to someone else's audience. 
The beauty about both of these, really, and being a resource, is now I'm stepping in front of a microphone, but I'm stepping in front of somebody else's microphone on their platform to their trusted audience. And now, naturally, by doing either of these two, I'm naturally already received because that person has already built an audience that trusts them. So that trust factor carries over to me or to you or to anybody else that's on them. It's an easy way, and it's an easy way most business owners miss. Of course, you need to find the right one, right? You have to have your avatar right and make sure you get onto the right post. And again, it's providing value. Providing value from the, the person that owns this and also the person that's your end target user. And then, of course, be a resource for the media. Uh, sounds simple, but there's things like Haro you can subscribe to, which is help a reporter out. You know, I get these alerts, and I probably get 50 a day where reporters are looking for stories. They're looking for business stories. They want to interview somebody on finance. They want to interview somebody on IT. They want to interview somebody you know, that's a trainer. They want to interview people because they need sources for all of their stories. And these stories go in magazines. You know, I, I was featured in a magazine, and <laughs> that's when my clients were like, oh, I saw you in there. Now it makes sense. Like, what? I've been telling the same thing for years. <laughs> and now because I'm in this magazine, like quoted, like now all of a sudden I'm credible? Like, this is ridiculous. Uh, but it, it's true. How many times do you read a story, whether it be in a business magazine or fitness magazine, and you, you see the person that's quoted, and the next thing you think of is like, oh, geez, that person must be an expert because they're a credible source. Well, they probably are. And more relevantly, they probably have a good story, and they were there when the reporter says, geez, I need help. Because guess what? Most reporters are contractors, and they know nothing about the subjects they write on. Nothing. Set up alerts. Key terms in industry. You can set up alerts. So in Rich's case, he can set up alerts for things going about books, things about wealth management in his area. It's really easy to do. There's websites like mention.com. Google has alerts. So anytime something that's a key term, or especially a branded term, so if someone's talking about your brand online, or your competitor's brand, you want to know about it and you want to be there. And this is really easy to automate and make sure that you're, again, first to mind and the person that actually steps up and raises their hand and is there to answer the questions. And don't forget email. And this is a big, big one that I think most people miss. All of us get email, and I would guess that most of you say that I would never, I don't buy things via email because that's what I hear from everybody. But I can tell you as somebody that markets to you, statistically you do. <laughs> uh, it's true. So I was looking at a bunch of statistics to pull for this because I was trying to figure out what is the actual ROI and there's a bunch of numbers that are thrown around. But average is about $43 in ROI for every dollar spent on email marketing. Right? And that's a huge number. You know, and then I found numbers much higher and I found numbers much lower. And then 72% of consumers that were interviewed, and this was an email marketing magazine online, uh, favored that to be their number one communication with a business. Now who hears, I mean everybody's like, oh I send out maybe an email newsletter once a month, or maybe once every couple months if, if it gets around to it. But who has an effective strategy to send email and to communicate with people on a one-on-one -on -one basis and actually run their email marketing like you run your business that's very effective and efficient? Most people don't. Most people scramble at the last minute they have you know, Joe sitting over in the corner, like, crap, we need something, we need a story. Um, Joe, go, um, go look up something that's a, uh, that's a tip, a financial tip that people will actually want to read. People don't read those. People want human interest stories. I can tell you, somebody looks at analytics way too often, statistically people are going to click on the story about somebody within the company or a client or a founder more than they'll t t uh, click on whatever somebody thinks the most valuable content is, right? So Rich could write, Here's the strategy you need to implement today to become a millionaire. And but he could also write something about his RV trip uh, up the Pacific Coast. I can bet you, and I, I'm not a betting person, but in this case I would become one, that people are going to read the story more often than they're going to read about how to become a millionaire, even though it's perfectly written. Well, they're looking to watch me go crazy. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So here's a, here's a funnel that I wrote for a client. And so if you've got the slides, you can use it. But you have an indoctrination series, engagement series. And the point of putting this up there is to show you there should be a strategy behind it. It's not just send out an email and hope that people like it. What's the strategy? What are you clicking? For the first time in the history of business, we're actually able to look at the analytics and see what people are doing. What do they like? What do they don't like? What are they actually utilizing? And how does it actually work within a business model? So this is a really effective way to get out there. So for Rich, I'm going to use him, keep using him as my example, but I could use anybody here. You know, if he's putting this out there to his email list or to you, he can decide who is actually interested in the book. Who says, yeah, I want a copy of that. And then how does he engage and follow up? And this, most of this can be automated 
but then you should be segmenting those buckets. These are the people that were interested, that got the book. These are the people that said they were interested, but eh, maybe didn't want the book. And these are the people that didn't reply at all, right? So now he has two, three different strategies to engage those people and keep them in the buying process. And so Brad, for example, he may be saying, hey, look, I'm already way on my path to, to the riches and I don't need that now. But maybe four months from now, Brad might be going, you know what? You know, I got kids are getting older. I, I need to start working on my finances. If Rich has effectively engaged Brad through that whole period of time when Brad's in the buying phase, that's when Brad puts his hand up and he, he knows Rich is there. Otherwise, Brad's going to go to the nearest person of next Troika that he's going to see it's first to mind. We all do it. Right? How often do you have a friend or a family member who uses somebody else for your product or service? It happens to all of us. You know, you're like, wait, what, what about me? And they just forgot. It's just quick and easy. So, and I'll just try to wrap this up, but in short, this is what the reaction I get from most people when we look at complicated marketing funnels, but it's no more complicated than anything else that you do. It's just a matter of adding strategy to the story that you're going to tell. You know, just telling a story doesn't do any of us any good. It's adding a strategic plan to that story to get it out there effectively is really the critical element. So what I try to do in every talk I do is give you just three actions, just three things you can do today to move forward with your business and grow it is identify your avatar and I can't maybe there's been one or two in the past couple of years of businesses that I've gone into even at the C-suite level where they have full marketing teams that really know what their avatar is it's so rare I highly recommend spending a time get some coffee get your team together interview survey find out who your real clients are not who you think they're who really are they maybe you're right go hunting you know we're all hunters here if you're a business owner that's what you do Determine where your ideal market is truly spending their time and make sure you're there too. So if Rich is, if I'm trying to get to Rich and I talk to Rich about Facebook, Rich's original conversation was well, my clients aren't on there. We're talking about Rich and he's like, crap, I'm on Facebook. I check. Where are your clients really? Where are they really doing? What are they really doing? We all have this per perceived notion that they might be doing X, Y, and Z. But what else are they doing? Be social. This is critical. You don't just throw out social media if you're using social media for business. It's a two-way street. Social media is social media. You need to communicate and communicate effectively. And be human. You know, people don't expect you to be perfect. They just don't. That's in your own mind's eye. They're okay with you make mistakes as long as you communicate to them about that and talk to them. But also be there and listen. So if someone's talking about your brand online, you want to be the first person to step up, raise your hand, and talk to them. Elon Musk does this really effectively, you know, for him and his company. You talk about Tesla or the products, they're there. They're the first person to step up and add to the conversation. Either apologize, add to it, give stats. They're, they, they're just there in the conversation as if they were in a room together talking. <coughs> so that's it today. Um, we're running out of time, but if you have any questions, we're happy to take them. Yeah? Um, what do you do if you don't really have an answer? If you don't really know target audience or demographics are, for example, my new practice which is hypnotherapy, it's kind of a personal thing. I don't know who has wants to do smoking cessation or lose weight or learn to be okay with flying or have relationship issues or whatever. It's a personal thing. So it's not like for my other business with weddings, I, I, you know, I'm on all those wedding websites and stuff. But with a personal thing like that, like a psychology kind of thing, how would I target a demographic? Well, I would argue one actually feeds into the other, right? If you're already working with people getting married, it's like, holy mackerel, you don't need your other service. You've got the whole market corner. Uh, so, great question. So, it's a psychographic, right? So, it's still your avatar. So, smoking cessation, you can start, there's statistics online. You can get market research. You can interview people as they come in. You can interview people you know, but you can also look at who wants smoking cessation. Well, smokers. That's a checkbox, right? We know they smoke. If they want to stop, why do they want to stop? That's the critical element is what's the why? Why do they want to do it? So why do most people want to stop smoking? What's going on? And then start listing those ideas, right? We know that they're probably over 18, but most likely if they're coming to see you, they might be over 30, right? So we can start narrowing this down and we start going through those checkboxes. So I have a form, and I'm happy to send it to you, that we use the basic form, but our long avatar list gets really in-depth when we start talking about, geez, what, do we, what magazines do they read? Where are they? And I think the critical thing is putting yourself in that person's shoes and acting as if. And you, it's hard to narrow it down right away, 
But over time, you're able to kind of chip away at that and go, you know what? Most people that are coming to see me are, are married. You know, or they're separated or they're 14. You'll start to figure out where your avatar is and always working on it. And I recommend doing it at least every six months of really wiping it out, interviewing your people, and reworking your avatar. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Any other questions? Huh? Well, thank you guys. The channel will be good. Remember next month again, fourth Wednesday at the uh, Funk Zone location, and bring your friends, fill our rooms. If there's value here, we're, we're striving to continue to to bring it, and uh, hopefully this has been a worthwhile endeavor for you this morning. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.